<clears throat> okay, hello everyone, and thank you for taking the time to attend our webinar today on managing emotions, self care, and resilience. My name is Erin Bruff with the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, and I will be your moderator today. I will be here on standby to help you with any technical issues you might run into. As we move through our presentation today, I just wanna remind you to feel free to use the question and answer function in the Zoom webinar. And then you can also use the chat function as well. And we'll have some parts of our presentation where we'll ask you to participate. Uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Robin Stern and Nikki Albertson. Robin, would you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, Erin. So welcome everyone um, for taking the time to come together at a very challenging time to, to hear about how uh, nurturing your resilience and taking care of yourself can, can make this a more um, helpful and easy experience for you, or easy as can possibly be and hopefully meaningful. Um, I'm a psychoanalyst by training, and um, I'm the Associate Director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. I uh, had the experience of being in New York City on September 11th, and then 10 years later had the privilege to work with the young journalist, Courtney Martin. She and I um, interviewed the survivors of 9-11, both people who had themselves been in the towers and people who had lost loved ones and we heard their stories. Then I was awed by, by the power of this, the human spirit to restore itself. And I'm just as awed right now as I see the throngs of people helping others and people feeling um, buoyed by the, the love and care of, um, their, of the humanity around them. And therein lies the miracle. They did it then and we're doing it now. And in fact, people, people show resilience all the time in response to personal challenges, not just national challenges. They weather the storm, they emerge from the storm, and they rebuild their lives, although changed, for sure. So I've drawn from this experience and from my experience living through this time now, as well as just the experiences of friends and family and my colleagues, to put together some insights that I'll share with you during this webinar, and I certainly hope they'll be helpful. And first, I'll turn it over to Nikki. Hi, everyone. My name is Nikki Albertson. As I said in the sound check, I'm the Director of Content and Communications at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. I work with Robin. I've actually been there for almost 18 years as a trainer, a coach, and a developer of content um, for Ruler, which is our school based program that many of you know about and use in your schools. In my time outside of my work at the Emotional Center for Emotional Intelligence, I am a group fitness instructor and I have certifications in personal training and a graduate degree in nutrition. So um, I've kind of pulled together a lot of that um, information and my background for some of the content that I'm gonna cover today. So this is a quote I stumbled upon um, a few months ago when I was about to deliver a big speech and it just really spoke to me. And you can read it for yourself silently and I'll also read it out loud here. Self-care means giving the world the best of you instead of what's left of you. And I think personally as someone who works full time and has a son and a stepson and who just in general feels like I already um, take time out for myself to teach my classes, for instance, I think it feels like it's a little selfish sometimes to take a bath or to do something special for myself. And um, I think it's really important to remind ourselves that self-care is actually not selfish at all. So what is self-care? It's not selfish. It's about taking good care of ourselves. And we take good care of ourselves for us, but we take good care of ourselves to stay strong for those around us. And it's more important than ever in these times. It's also a pathway to resilience. 
Robin's going to spend some time talking about resilience in a deeper way later, but I want to define it briefly for you. Resilience is just really the capacity to recover from and adapt to challenging situations. Uh, of over a thousand people re registered for today's webinar. So if you think about a thousand people, we probably all have very, very different situations. I know I spend my days at home with my husband, son, sister, her dog, her cat, my cats in the background, and I'm in front of my computer a lot. But I know there are people on this webinar who are out in the field. My brother works at a grocery store, he's there. So there are people who are um, outside of their homes more than others, but wherever we are, we all are in a new challenging situation. And the good news about resilience is it isn't something that we have or we don't have, it's something that we can develop. And it's something that we can really build during challenging times. And there are many pathways to resilience. As I mentioned, um, based on my background, I'm gonna talk a little bit about resilience through what we can do for our body. Next slide, please. Thanks. So the body and the mind are not too completely separate things. And we'll speak a little bit about the body and we'll speak later about the mind, but I just wanna recognize here that they're absolutely intertwined. So things that we do for our body can help us mentally and they're not completely separate. So one thing we can do for both that, that really originates in our body is breathe. And breathing is something that we can do anytime, any place. The important part about breathing intentionally and in order to breathe for self-care is to breathe deeply and slowly. I mentioned I've been at the Center for Emotional Intelligence for almost 20 years now, and I used to kind of giggle and roll my eyes when we would talk about breathing, and I said, I don't need that strategy. I'm not someone who meditates or does yoga or anything, so it kind of felt hokey to me to breathe until there were some times in my life where I really needed it and I kind of just did it and I was like, well, I'll try this thing, this breathing thing. And I got so much out of it. I tend to be an anxious person and I tend to tense up a lot and it's really amazing what breathing can do. I wanted to put some of the science of breathing here. If you attended one of um, Mark Brackett's presentations, there's a little bit of overlap here because he and I feel very strongly about some of these same things. But um, I think it's a little bit of a different angle on some of the coming slides. But basically, when we breathe intentionally, when we breathe deeply and slowly, it brings more oxygen in and it really changes the chemistry of our brain. So there are effects of stress and excitement that happen to our bodies and our brains that we can shut down when we take that slow, deep breath. And we can activate our brain in a way where we can think more clearly, make better decisions, problem solve, and just feel calmer overall. So I thought, because I am the one who always thought it was such a hokey thing, I thought I would lead just a few deep intentional breaths because even though I wanna roll my eyes, I think it's what many of us just need right now. And I've been trying to integrate more of it into my daily life. So if you could, you know, just get sort of tall in your chair, I grew just a couple of inches, um, maybe roll your shoulders back. You could close your eyes or look down, whatever's comfortable for you. And just try inhaling to the count of three. So we'll go three, two, one in, and three, two, one out. Do two more of those. Three, and three. One more. And I feel so much more relaxed already. It's really, it's one of those things, as I said, I dismissed it for so long and I find so much power in it now. It was wonderful, thanks. So what else can we do besides taking those breaths? We can get enough sleep. And I mentioned that, you know, some of these strategies are more important now than ever before. Sleep is harder, I think now, especially I mentioned I have more people, more animals in my house, and some of us have animals around all the time who wake us up. And then we have more anxiety. We have more things spinning through our minds at night. We care about loved ones that might be sick or have a higher risk for being sick. We might be thinking about the safety of going to the grocery store. There are a million things running through our heads at night. So 
I want to just emphasize something we already know that getting enough sleep is absolutely essential for our functioning, for our mental health and our physical health. Health. It helps us to think clearer, make better decisions, manage our emotions better, and just in general gives us more energy and a stronger immune system, also very important in these times. So if we're striving for that sort of seven, seven to nine hours as a sweet spot, if you know that you're going to be up in the middle of the night with your dog or your child, or you're going to be up in the night because your mind spins and you're up for an hour or two, the recommendation is to just go to bed a little bit earlier so that altogether you get seven to nine hours of sleep um, when you subtract that, that time that you don't get. And there's a lot of research to show that having some kind of pre-bedtime ritual to calm yourself, blue light from our computer screens, our phones keeps us awake. So turning that off about an hour before, trying not to drink alcohol up to three hours before you go to bed can help with staying asleep um, and just having um, some kind of habit that you do to calm yourself before bed so that you can fall asleep more quickly. But I think it's important to remind ourselves that fuel, food is fuel. Food is fuel for our bodies and food is fuel for our minds. And just like we wouldn't put um, anything other than good quality gasoline in our cars, we really should think about putting the best quality food in our bodies so that we can think clearly and so that we can be at our best physically. Interestingly, there's a whole lot of research that shows that what we eat affects our mood, affects our emotions, and then the reverse is true as well. So mood can affect um, what we eat. And again, um, if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling stressed, you're more likely to reach for the ice cream and the pizza than the celery. But when you eat a lot of heavy foods, then you get tired or eventually you may crash. So recommendations just based on research here to eat whole foods, eat a blend of nutrients, so protein, healthy fats, avocado and nuts, uh, olive oil, and then whole carbs. So an interesting fact that we talk about at our center is that Glucose is really the only um, source of fuel that our brains have, unless we're in starvation mode or in ketosis, then ketones can also provide our brain with fuel. But in general, we need carbs to think clearly. So it's important, I know some people are on super, super low carb diets. If your body's used to that, fine, you're operating off of the ketones. But otherwise, we need some whole sources of carbohydrate in our diet to function well, both physically and mentally. One of the things that I really push whenever I'm working with um, anybody who's interested in healthy eating is to have comfort foods in moderation. I think it's okay, especially if you feel like you have control over it, because some people feel like if they have one cookie, they'll have the whole box. But within reason, you know, kind of think about what foods provide you with comfort and um, squeeze those in. That's healthy eating. Healthy eating is something that doesn't stress you out and that you don't have to monitor 24-7. But with that, make sure that you're moderating sugar, alcohol, et cetera. And just like with anything else, just accept the fact that you're going to make mistakes one meal, one day, one week, one COVID experience, whatever it is, and then get back on track as soon as you can. And just a recommendation for um, doing this, just having healthy food ready and accessible, having the junk food out of sight. So you might think of it, but it's not always there when you walk into the kitchen, the first thing you see. So having, you know, vegetables chopped up or frozen fruits defrosted, et cetera. So moving our bodies is also important. I mentioned I'm a fitness instructor and um, I think more than anything, this is the thing that really helps me manage my stress. Uh, this over the this past weekend, I was so so stressed out, um, just trying to manage everything. There's so much pet hair in my house right now between the dog and the three cats, and no matter how much I vacuum, it's everywhere. It's like I breathe and I have some on my lip or in my nose. And um, between the, the animal hair and everybody being in the house all the time, it was raining all weekend. I was so, so, so stressed out. And my husband said, go work out. And he's like, we'll stay in here. And it's just what I needed. I just need, I did a, um, there are virtual classes online. I did a kickboxing class online. And for me, that was what I needed for my own mental and emotional health, health but also so that I could interact as a saner person with my um, husband and son and sister afterward. So it's really important. 
for our mental health, for our sanity, but it also gives us energy, strengthens our body. And I'm sure many of you have heard these things before, but it's a nice reminder that um, it strengthens our immune system, helps us sleep better. So the two work together, physical activity and sleeping. And there's some interesting research that shows that we're setting an example for our children. So if you're a parent and they see that you're active or if you bring them along with you, um, they tend to pick up those habits and carry those habits of physical activity through their lives helps us to live longer and helps to give more life to our days. And then we mentioned some of us aren't eating as well as usual. So maybe burning more calories can kind of temper the effect of some of our poorer choices in these times. And again, um, I think it's different for everyone. Some people love to put music on and dance around or put music on and clean their house at a higher speed. Some people like to take walks. I like to do my classes online. It looks a little bit different for everyone. And I think the key is really finding something that works for you. And the final thing I wanna say about all of this is um, the research really supports that we need to have a plan. So I said a lot of different things. Um, research also, also shows we don't wanna tackle it all at once. So I wouldn't say you should leave this webinar and decide on a whole new healthy eating plan and exercise every day and getting nine hours of sleep a night. No, so break it down. And first, just kind of think about what are your barriers? I mentioned um, some of the people in my house, the animals. I used to work out in the evening. I teach classes in the evening pre-COVID and I really don't like working out in the morning. But now I found that, you know what, that's the only time when everybody else is asleep, the animals are out of the way, no one's bothering me. And so I've been trying to get something in in the morning. So thinking about what your barriers are and then what your opportunities are. Um, even though I don't like working out in the morning, I actually am a morning person, so I'm way more motivated in the morning to exercise then. And we all sort of vary in our times of day when we're the most motivated. So kind of thinking about yourself, the things in your environment that might prevent you from these healthy behaviors, and then what you can do to change some of those things. And just also, I mean, ask yourself what's most important. I was talking to my sister who's now living with me and uh, she, you know, she was saying, you know what, if at the end of this I gain 10 pounds, I'm okay with that. You know, so I mean, maybe it's not the most important thing to get your usual level of physical activity or maybe you're gonna sacrifice a little bit of sleep, but definitely keep in mind what is important for you to change for your sanity, for your physical health and set small goals and then celebrate when you achieve them. So this is an opportunity I've talked quite a bit to just put some things in the chat box here. Just something that you think would be interesting to share, maybe something I didn't mention um, that might help someone else or something that you thought of that you could try to build resilience in your body to help with your physical health and mental health through sleep, physical activity. Meditation. Eating better, exactly. Somebody said that they call their cat hair glitter. Okay. Oh, I love that. That that <laughs> I don't know if I think of it. I also hate glitter, so <laughs> pray, <clears throat> dancing, journaling. Yeah. Be creative. I actually I didn't mention that one, but um I love to make jewelry. And so that's the other one of the other things I've been doing in the evenings is beading. And my husband plays piano. He's a music teacher, and so he's crazy trying to get all of his um music technology classes online, and he teaches a few other music-related music theory. Um, but in the evenings, he plays piano and guitar, and we sing together. Lots of water, great point. I didn't mention that when I mentioned food. Um, that definitely can help with eating less food and keeping hydrated and thinking more clearly. And Nikki, maybe you can share the link to your singing to people on the record. No, thanks. <laughs> Crossing, right? Mindfulness, taking walks, fantastic. This is great. Okay. So uh, now, thank you, Nikki, for that wonderful unpacking of the resilient body. And now we'll turn our attention to the resilient mind. So the resilient mind uh, tells us to let go. And again, to remind you, as Nikki said before, resilience is that miraculous process by which people whose lives have been shattered in an instant can pick up the pieces and rebuild and go bring them back together, not in the same way, but in a new way, in a refreshed way. And 
letting go of what? Letting go of expectations that things are going to get better immediately. Letting go of expectations of getting together with people on a timeline that you wish you could set. Letting go of the you that you were before this happened and being open to embracing a new self. Maybe you see yourself as somebody who's very structured and can't possibly function without that. Well, be open to embracing a new self, maybe anchoring some parts of your day, but not needing, telling yourself a story that you are not now a person who needs to have exactly the same structure. Elizabeth Lesser, author of the book Broken Open, writes, Taking responsibility and giving up control are two sides of the healing coin. Very wise. You've got to give up the control that you can have exactly the same you you were before this happened or exactly the same week you planned on. And the other thing importantly to let go of is the idea that this kind of crisis could never happen. We were talking earlier today about how many of us saw the movie Contagion a few years ago. And we, that's Hollywood, we said, right? Well, when I, I live in New York City and I was walking down the street the other day and I felt like I saw it in a movie. And in fact, I did see it in that movie. And now we are living that movie just so tragically. So accepting that this crisis thought could never happen and would only stay in Hollywood is actually happening. It's very real. And we need to nurture our resilience so that we can move through it. Next slide, please. The resilient mind helps us find strength and growth in the trauma, in negotiating the everyday of it. So how do we build strength through trauma? So psychoanalysts say that any trauma national or personal during any trauma part of you changes will never be the same and we're hearing now that many people are grieving for those parts of us that don't have expression this spring for parts of our lives that may be open the law that may have been open and now are closed parts uh, business that may be closed or um a tragedy that befell our family that is a result of the virus and grieving helps you to look at your life in a different way and bring it forward and learn from it and just allows you to have the, that range of feelings that even in your giving yourself space to have the feeling, you are building, you are nurturing your resilience. And we asked, do, is post-traumatic strength or growth a growth, the result of biology? Is it our personality? Is it our spirit? Is it love? Is it skills? What we hear from research is that social support, finding a network of people who care about you and exchanging with that network and letting them know that you care about them as well is key to healing during this time. Cognitive reframing, telling yourself a different story about what's going on in the moment. Okay, so um, it's not a disaster that I can't uh, see my cousins this weekend. And I'll really look forward to seeing them um, down the road. A very close friend of mine wrote and said, you know, we just canceled our Passover Seder. Another friend of mine wrote, we just canceled Easter. How do you cancel Easter? How do you cancel Passover without it feeling like a huge loss? And then each one of them wrote in a different time, well, you know what? We're just going to look forward to having the most amazing celebration the next time our family gets together. So that kind of telling yourself a new story, especially in the context of social support where other people are feeling that, very healing. Next slide, please. The resilient mind knows that love is healing. And what I mean by, he by love here is both romantic love and the love of friends and family. And while tra trauma and this kind of um, period where there may be a lot of loss and grief leaves you completely fragmented. Um, it also opens your heart to the healing power that relationships can offer, that the power of love can offer you. And love and relationships are motivating. They keep us socially connected. I'm connecting to people from high school who I haven't spoken to in years, virtually. I'm connecting to cousins who I never have time to talk to. 
but I'm thinking about them and, and that feeling of wanting to, to reach out and tell them I love them and I care about them is keeping me more connected to them than I have before. Love is generative. It brings us together in community just like now. And love is forgiving. It allows me to accept that um, even though I'm recently married, uh, I was not planning to spend every single day for the next unlimited amount of time with my husband. We tend to live very independent lives and come together on weekends and see each other a little bit during the week. But it, it, I'm accepting that it's not going to be perfect. And it hasn't been perfect. And that's okay. We're living in forest closeness, all of us. The resilient mind allows us to really take in that this is a new normal. The past decade has been a new normal, if not the past two decades, actually, where the extraordinary has become ordinary. Extraordinary events like 9-11, like Hurricane Sandy, like Katrina, like the devastating murders at Sandy Hook, and now like the COVID virus. And it unfortunately is more ordinary than we'd like it to be. And on the flip side of that, the ordinary day-to-day -day, um, connectedness, uh, freedom is now extraordinary. The touch of your hand, again, the, the, the touch of your hand to someone else or with somebody else. Somebody's touching your cheek, somebody's putting their arms around you, somebody's giving you a, like a, just rubbing your shoulder when you say, hey, how you doing? Isn't the mundane really beautiful? And isn't this a time to appreciate that? The ordinary is extraordinary. The resilient mind tells us that healing is something that we do in our own way. We've been hearing more and more from people that they're grieving, that they're grieving the loss of their graduation, they're grieving the loss of a vacation, they're grieving the loss of a friend, or of their job, or of economic stability. And grief is not a linear process. Grief is more like a roller coaster, and every roller coaster ride is unique. It's healing is not about bouncing back because you're not going back to someone you are becoming. And there is no right or wrong way to express feelings of from anxiety to grief. Some people cry, some people are anxious and they deal with it in other ways. Some people are not expressive to other people, but they are hearing it inside of themselves. And there's also no right amount of time or is there a time limit on how long you should be grieving or sad or anxious or how long you should be joyful that you have this time off from work. Some people are feeling guilty that they're actually not in their office. I shouldn't even say time off from work because many of us are working even longer hours. But many people are feeling guilty. Wow, I'm liking this. And such a terrible thing caused it. There's no right and there's no right amount of time. And normally in our day-to-day -day routine, we don't stop to prioritize. We do what the next thing is that's in front of us. And at a time where the end of the workday or the beginning of the school day or family dinner governs our limits, we, we know what to do. But at a time where uncertainty governs our limits, we don't know how to negotiate that. We're just learning now. We're learning, as Nikki said, that scheduling and planning is helpful to help us move through these uncertain times. But we're not used to it, and we're uncomfortable. And we don't know how to manage being uncomfortable. So intention and purpose become even more important as we set up for our daily lives. And related to that, next slide, please is the power of pausing. So it's as if the universe said, it's time for the world to pause. And for each one of us individually, who have moved with more, better, faster, more, better, faster, more, better, faster, we are now on pause. And our basic needs take priority. 
Do we have enough toilet paper? How many articles did you read about that, right? Do we have enough food to stay healthy? And as Nikki said, to keep ourselves healthy, nutritious food. Do we have the safety of shelter so that we're not sick? Are we able to, to keep ourselves healthy? Are we able to not go to work and expose ourselves to risk? And do we have love? And our emotional needs also need attention. You have needs to belong. You have needs to feel a sense of attachment in a healthy way and care and love and compassion. And making meaning of all of this and this experience is part of the resilient mindset as well. So how can you make your life after this event even more meaningful based on anything that you may take away from you, any learning from this, from this time? One of the things that we noticed after 9-11 is that people were asking themselves the questions that they could have asked on September 10th, but didn't. And most of us don't ask ourselves the questions often enough, like, Am I living the life I want? Am I surrounded by the people I want to be surrounded by? Am I giving the world the way I want to be giving? Am I using my energy wisely? Important questions. We invite you to ask them to yourselves. And the way you tell the story of what's happened to you will reflect your resilience and, and promote your healing. Do you see it as a time where you were victimized or do you see this story of what is happening at a time where maybe it is of course sad and it is of course tragic and we have been out of control. We didn't, nobody asked for this. At the same time, it is also an opportunity to look at the balance in your life, to look at the joy you do get, the gratitude, the things that you can appreciate in your life in a different way. Next slide. So now it's your turn. How can you apply any of these concepts on nurturing resilience to, to help nurture resilience in your mind? Letting go, finding the growth and strength that emerges from trauma, loving more in order to heal, surrounding yourself with social support, accepting a new normal, accepting that the extraordinary is sadly ordinary and ordinary can become extraordinary. Acknowledging the time is altered and taking a pause and making new meaning out of what's happened. So we'd love to hear from you. People are journaling, people are remembering to offer grace, accepting the new normal, Letting go of expectations, accepting the new normal, strength and discipline, gratitude, self-forgiveness, so important to have compassion for yourself, accepting when you make mistakes, forgiving unkind words. Thank you for your input about that. So we thought we'd share with you a, um, a piece from the New York Times on how we got by New Yorkers advice for getting through a tough time. I'll just read the highlighted sections. So somebody suggests, so one New Yorker said somebody once suggested that when you're stuck in a situation that you can't do anything about, the best thing to do is to immerse yourself in study. Many people are studying, are you one of them? Someone else said, when I was on a run, I thought I was doing the right thing to think. This is temporary. I don't need to enjoy this. But now I see that you have to enjoy these times, that we have to treat this time as an opportunity. And the last one to share. The thing I learned in the, in the core is, that the, is the absolute necessity of the person to your right and to your left in the Marines. In the, oh, sorry, in the Marines, we're taught to look out for each other to make sure we survive in times of great stress. Christ reshuffles the deck that we call society. So there's an opportunity now for meaningful social progression and change. That's my favorite. 
My husband actually is a former Marine and um, we actually took a walk together. It's the first walk he and I have taken just the two of us since I can remember. And we were talking about this webinar. This was last night. And he said in, when he was a Marine, which was in the late 90s, that um, they always taught them about the importance of the breath and you know how important it is, but they never explained the research or the science behind it. And uh, he thought it was really interesting for me to share some of the science behind breathing. So I would share that connected to the last thing that Robin shared. But we are from the Center for Emotional Intelligence, as we said at the beginning of the webinar. So we just want to remind everyone about some of our key concepts that we always are talking about. But emotions have the power to heal us. We're all experiencing a range of emotions right now. And um, we can accept them and we can grow for them. And I think from them. And I think Robin mentioned a lot of different ways we can grow from our emotions. Emotional intelligence itself really is about the skills we use to um, kind of leverage the power of emotions, specifically recognizing them. Um, but we can also tune into our emotional awareness too. So kind of having that awareness in our in our heads of how we're feeling and what we can do with those feelings so that they're serving us rather than derailing us. Like my emotions derailed me a little bit before I did that online kickboxing class on Sunday, but I kind of channeled them into the kickboxing class. I was punching and kicking very hard and I felt a lot better emotionally after I did that. So expressing your thoughts and feelings, um, doing the things you need and then expressing them with other people really important too. So we do focus um, a lot on feeling better as a society. And I mentioned, you know, I was really stressed and then I felt relieved and I felt better after I um, punched in my kitchen with my kickboxing video. Um, so we want to say a little bit about pleasant emotions. There's positive self-talk that we can use all of the time. My favorite self-talk that is not positive is, oh, Nikki, um, you're such an idiot. You're such an idiot. Every time I make a mistake, you're such an idiot. And so um, what can you say that's different? And, you know, there's self-talk that I, I say sometimes when I got the message that my son's school is going to be closed for another month. It's like, how am I going to deal with this? How am I going to handle this? And so just kind of challenging your self-talk that you use that might not be so positive and supportive and saying something different to yourself, recognizing, oh, that's really not useful to call myself an idiot. That's not really useful to have that sort of worst case scenario mindset. And what can I say to myself that nurtures a more positive view? What's another story I can tell myself? focusing on hopes for the future. So we've had a lot more time as a family to reflect and talk about the future. My son actually turns 10 in May. So we're talking about that birthday party whenever it happens. We are gonna do some virtual things in the meantime, but you know, thinking down the road, um, I think a lot of what's happening right now will actually bring us closer and help us to appreciate all of the social um, connections that we have in this time of social distancing, which is really just physical distancing, it makes us realize um, how important it is to have those connections uh, touch and be close to people and be in the same room with people, go out to dinner with people. So um, we'll have new hopes and expectations for the future based on some of the things we've lost in this moment. Gratitude, I always try to remind myself of um, all of the things I'm grateful for and you know, we're all in very different situations. I mentioned, I talked to my brother, he's in Oregon and he works at a grocery store and he has to go to work every day. I have a very good friend who's a bank teller and she has to go to work every day. I have friends who are doctors and nurses and I'm sitting here complaining behind my computer eight, nine hours a day that I, my back hurts from sitting in front of my computer, but I have a job and I'm getting paid. And um, we all have different situations, no matter how bad it is for any of us, there's always something to be grateful for. And again, it takes a little pushing sometimes to, to get our brains to shift to that from the, oh my God, this is so, so hard to, you know what, I have this thing or this thing to be uh, appreciative of, grateful for. And then just showing your appreciation. I try to text my brother, call my brother and say, hey, you know, by being in that grocery store that makes you really nervous being there and that's really frustrating for you right now, um, you're helping a whole lot of people. So many of you, or at least some of you are from ruler schools, you may have seen this mood meter. 
Um, just want to explain how it works really quickly. You can find it online for free if you Google it or if you go to our ruler website, rulerapproach.org. It's basically just recognizing that our, that our emotions are really composed of two different uh, variables, how pleasant we feel on the x-axis. It's a little bit of math for some of us who haven't seen um, a graph in a while. This was a little bit of learning for me when I took a look at it for the first time, but um, how pleasant we feel, kind of our mental um, evaluation of, of things. So am I feeling good or am I feeling bad? Am I feeling pleasant or unpleasant? And then the energy is really, um, I like to show it this way. So the pleasantness is up kind of our mental evaluation and the energy is kind of how much energy is coursing through your body. Do you feel tense or do you feel less tense, more open with your posture, et cetera. And when you cross these two variables, how pleasant we feel and all of that energy that's coursing through our body, we get these four quadrants or colors. And we're showing this now to just say, you know, it's okay that all of us are feeling a lot of different things right now. Like I've been jumping back and forth between, I would say the red and the green. I'm not someone who lives in that calm, um, low energy place very often, but I have to say I'll be anxious for a lot of the day. And then I go on a walk with my family or we cook dinner together for the first time again in a really long time. And I get into that green space. So just accepting our emotions, giving ourselves the permission to experience the range of emotions is really important in this time. And we kind of mentioned this in, um, from different angles throughout the webinar today, but just finding things that work for you. We're all a little different. We saw a bunch of different strategies in the chat box and we're all unique individuals who have um, different needs and really just taking time to think about what works for you? What emotions are you experiencing? We're all very different in that way um, in terms of what emotions we tend to experience. Some people tend to be anxious. Some people tend to be sad. So thinking about what you're going through and what strategies you're using to manage those emotions and what you can do differently. So as we close for today, um... First, thank you again for showing up and for making this a meaningful moment in your life. We invite you to think about what would be different in your life if you took more time for self-care and for nurturing your resilience. What would be different in your life? I'd have more energy less anxiety, peace of mind. I would sleep better. Many of you were saying balance. Better focus. Many of you were saying that you'd be happier and healthier. So given that you think it would be a good thing for you to have better self-care and, and um, nurture your resilience, what's one thing you can commit to trying that you learned today? Or what's one thing that you can commit to thinking? A new, a new pair of lenses that you could put on that's different after this webinar. And write it down if you can. A lot of people are saying breathing. Gratitude, reframing, embracing what's happening, giving up control. So a lot of people are talking about the resilience of the body and how you can take care of that and, and others are talking about building resilience of your mind, letting go, taking different perspectives, feeling all your feelings, reminding myself I'm in the here and now, sharing some of these resilience tips, 
being present, loving kindness, meditation. For sure about that. Appreciating little things daily. So we're hearing that feelings matter, that appreciation, gratitude matters, that taking perspective matters, exercise and breathing. So I think that you've got it all, where the body and mind find itself integrated and um, where emotional intelligence and caring about your emotional life and nurturing that as well will make a difference too. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we hope that it was a meaningful experience for you. Yes, thank you so much, Robin and Nikki. Fantastic content. And um, I'm sure a lot of us are feeling a lot better, ready to take on the world. Um, so everyone, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, please note that a recording of this webinar will be sent to all of you, anyone who, have, who had registered within 48 hours of us concluding today. And we will keep you updated on any of our upcoming webinars. Please feel free to visit rulerapproach.org. And at the top there, you'll see a banner that will direct you to a web page that addresses some of the resources we have for schools and other communities during this COVID-19 outbreak. Thank you so much for joining us. Stay well. We'll see you again soon. Bye. Bye, everyone.